Hello everyone and welcome to another session of ZK white Whiteboard Sessions and today I'm here with Alexander from Polygon ID and we're going to be talking about the centralized ZK identity and how zero knowledge proofs fit into that. Hello Alexander. Thanks for having me. Let's start out with giving a bit of context like how do you think about identity and what different types of identity are there and just to set the context for the conversation. Yeah so there is two big groups of identity, we can say that there is physical identities. It would be like a passport, driver license, diploma, maybe some other paper, paper documents basically. Okay. And a big other group is digital identities. So with digital identities we have different subgroups. We can say that it, it was an evolution of digital identities and first one was siloed identities, or we can say centralized ones. I guess what would be an example of a centralized identity? For example, you have a website and you have login and password there. So it's a type of a centralized identity when you have just uh, for each website, you have your own login and password. It's like an account on the website. Yeah, we can think of digital identities as a identifier or account and then some data that we can say it's a claim that is statements about this identity. Okay. The next step was in evolution of digital identities, federated identities. So idea is that users don't want to have for each website new login and password. It's much easier to have just one, for example, to use a Facebook account or okay. use a Google account to log in to different websites, different applications, and just not to have to remember passwords for each website. Yeah. And I guess you also don't have to type your name every time, it just copies over, gets copied over from Facebook, yeah. things like that. It's uh, this feder federated identity providers, they're giving a lot of data, they're storing it on their websites, it's like your name, picture, email address, some other data, could be your social security number, could be passport data, and so on. And the main next step that we are going to talk today a lot is self-sovereign identities, or we can say decentralized identities. And so just to unpack the term a bit, what does self-sovereign mean? What is, the dif what is the difference between, let's say, centralized, federated, and so self or even just federated and self-sovereign? What is the main difference? Yeah, main difference is that you are in control of your own data. So it's not centralized in some database of this one identity provider, but it's on your phone, on your devices. And then you're sharing it with others on, on request. So in a way, I would say this is probably somewhat similar to physical identity because there, I guess, you also own the data, like you own the passport and whatnot. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, it's very similar in the way that you're bringing your identity with you and show it on only when you need it. Okay, makes sense. And I think you have to start to get into it, but I'm curious, what are the pros and cons? Like you mentioned, this is an evolution, so I'm assuming every subsequent step is better. But even if you compare it to physical ones, what are the benefits or like the downsides of using one form of identity versus another? So for all documents, I have pros and cons, like with any identity. You can easily lose your documents if we are talking about downsides. This could be forged, it could be destroyed, or you can just forget them at home when you are driving your car and you need to show driver's license and it's not with you. So that, that's downsides, but the good thing, that uh, good property that uh, we want in digital identities also, is that issuer of this document doesn't know where we are using it. Okay, so there is some degree of privacy. Yeah, some degree of privacy, but still the verifier, the one who is looking at your identity, for example, it could be policeman or it could be just shop assistant or something. In many cases, they don't need the full documents, full information from this document. They just need to know that you are over 18 or you have permission to enter something, or you have license maybe to do something. Yeah, and I guess giving out a document like reveals all the information in the document, or at least most of it. Okay, yeah, you. 
the driver license in the US, you actually have your address encoded, so or actually written down there. So it's not ideal to show it to a store clerk whenever you want to buy something that requires your age check. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Okay, so that is pros and cons of physical. Now let's move on to digital now. Yeah, regarding centralized identities, siloed, we can say that only the issuer or the website itself actually who is giving you access to the data knows that it's correct. So it's not easy to port this data to other places. Just showing picture from website doesn't prove anything. So you can not prove that you have balance on your bank account just by showing it's on website. So with federated identities, it's possible. So data is stored on centralized servers and you give access to it to others. It could be, as we talked, your profile picture, your name, could be your bank state. Yeah, but the thing is that the issuer is storing this data on its servers and it's tracking where you are using it first. And also identity provider could just stop servicing you. So mm -hmm. for example, if you have forgot your password, so password, you just cannot use it anymore or for any other reason you may be blocked from a platform. Yeah, so to go back to privacy, for example, it seems to me that federated identity versus physical situations reversed. There, the verifier can see data they shouldn't see. Here, I guess you can have the verifier may be given like select access to a given field, but here the issuer can see everywhere you use it, right? So it's interesting. And then, as you said, Facebook can block you for whatever reason. And then if you rely on Facebook to access other services, now you're blocked from all other services yeah. for, so that's definitely not an ideal situation to be in. Um, but yeah, but it's better than centralized, right? Because you don't need to right. copy things uh, right. from every website. <laughs> Still, it's not easily portable between different identity providers. So you may have data on Facebook, you may have data on Twitter, but you cannot just port it to as a third platform to use data from both. It's harder. To Makes do sense. That. Makes sense. But so what is the pros and cons of self-sovereign or decentralized identity? For decentralized identity, user is in a center. He receives identity claims, it stores it, yeah, them in their, it, its own wallet and can share whenever he wants and is required maybe to access something or just to publish a tweet or some article. It could be done in a form of a claim. So it's, could be, it could be a document or it could be just some what I'm saying. Okay, so it seems to me that self-sovereign identity combines in itself the convenience of digital identity, but also the, pro the properties of physical identities as well. So it's best of both worlds almost. Yeah. Okay, awesome. You mentioned a couple of times that now claims and identities, like what are the different pieces of identities? What are claims and how do they fit in? And we have issuers, verifiers. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So we, we have, we call this triangle of trust. We have a user, we have issuer, and we have verifier. Between the issuer and verifier, we have a link, it's not direct, but it's a trust. So we can say that for this to work, we need fire to trust issuer. And uh, so like in the case of passport, for example, I trust that like US government has issued the passport. If the passport has been forged, that they, the date of birth is correct on the passport because US government has verified it or something like that. Yeah, and it's checked with just, if it's a physical document, you can check that it looks good. It looks original, not forged, but with digital identities, self-sovereign identities, you can be sure that it's a correct one just by checking digital signatures. In our case, user, let's say we have university as an issuer, receives a claim about finishing some classes or courses. It would be a diploma or something. 
and it would be a claim issued from the university to the user. Okay. So we have this claim sent to the user. And then when user comes to employer, he wants to show that he has some knowledge, he has some trainings done, and he can present this claim to the verifier. But in our system, we, we don't want to reveal the whole data. If verifier doesn't need whole data from this claim, we can just say that, yeah, we have license and it's correct. And for that, we are using zero knowledge proofs. Okay, so this is where ZK comes in. So basically this is called a claim, right? From something that is issued from the issued the user. And is there a term for this side or is it also just verifying a claim or something like that? Yeah, it's a verifying okay. claim. And one other thing to ask, in this case, so we've been talking about the user as being a physical person. Is that how we should think about it? Or could a user be like some I don't know, yeah. machine, robot or whatever? Or how do, is, do we always want to tie identity to a physical user basically or a person? Yeah, you are right that uh, it could be anything actually. Identity and it could be belonging to a user, to a physical natural person, or it could be city, it could be organization, and it could be just a pen. Okay, makes sense. And then, as you mentioned here, so just to confirm, the ZK properties, or we use ZK proofs in cell sovereign identities to make sure we hide some information, right? Yes. So. And um, it only makes sense in the self sovereign context. Like for a federated identity, you don't really need a ZK proof, right? For example, because the, there is other ways to hide information in that context. There are some ways if identity provider, federated identity provider supports it. Okay. So if it doesn't support, then all the data is exposed. I see. And the user cannot do anything with it because in this case, verifier goes directly to the issuer without user. A user only gives permission to the platform to give his data to verifier. So in this case, verifier goes directly to the issuer and gets this data. Awesome, awesome. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, in our case for this zero knowledge proofs to work, we need some public data. And, and some private data. Yeah, so I guess in the context of self-sovereign identity, we talked about ZK proofs, but also I understand there is a blockchain aspect to it. Like how does blockchain tie into all of this? Yeah, so we have here blockchain to store anchors of these claims on chain. So for this trust link to work, we need identities of issuers to be published on chain. And this identity states of issuer, they are including claims and in our case also revocations. So when verifier receives this zero knowledge proof of some statement, he also needs to go to blockchain and check that data referred this zero knowledge proof is correct one and is on blockchain. And like to compare with federated and centralized identities, basically instead of using a central database to store the data, we're using blockchain, but we don't store the actual data on the blockchain. We store like the commitments to the data, you call them those anchors, right? So it's commitments and the actual data is stored on the user's device in a form of claims. And of course, users' public private keys are stored also on the user's device. Okay, makes sense. And then I'm just curious, I know, let's say blockchains don't have high throughput and all of that stuff, at least right now we're working on fixing, but for now, and that could be a challenge when you need to verify me or update claims periodically. If we talk about challenges with the system, so I'm guessing throughput is one, but what other challenges are there? Yeah, it was a big challenge for us to solve and we found a way with building a Merkle tree of claims and then publishing only the Merkle tree root on chain. Okay, I guess we'll get into the exact architecture in a few minutes, but yeah, okay, that makes sense. 
Any other challenges in terms of besides throughput or is that the main thing that... Yeah, when we are talking about blockchain, we need always to think about cost also. Like with this scalability, we are also solving this cost problem. Okay. And I guess using ZK solves the privacy aspect and okay. And one of the challenges we wanted to solve was ability to use this not only outside of blockchain, this identity and claims, but also on-chain. So that, that's a big problem we wanted to solve and we solved it. Okay, makes sense. Actually, one other question that I, I have about this. So if we talk about this is now the full system and you mentioned a few times like there is the revocation, what are the properties? So a user can get a claim from there and then the claim within the user. But you also mentioned that sometimes the claim can be revoked. Could you talk a little bit more about like why this is needed or how this is helpful? Yeah, imagine case when you lose your passport and you just don't want somebody to use it and or you lost your phone and it stores your keys, your claims and so on. And you need a way to revoke access to it, revoke claims maybe, or it could be just, uh, for example, issuer decides to revoke because it's not relevant anymore. For example, a claim could be that you are part of some DAO or a member of some group. If you are not a member of this group anymore, then issuer may revoke this. Okay, so these claims are dynamically updatable yes. and uh, in both directions, but only the issuer can revoke their own claims. That's the advantage where, yeah. in the case of Facebook, for example, Facebook can revoke your entire identity. Here, it's much more surgical what a specific issuer can do. Yeah, it's much more granular. Yeah. Yes. All right. So now let's dive into Polygon ID. What is, what is the overall architecture? How do you guys implement this specifically in Polygon ID? What are the di different moving pieces? Yeah, right now I will describe how it's these commitments work, what we are publishing on-chain, what stays off-chain, and how it's working. So we have issuer and it has identity and for it to work we need identity state on chain so this is this commitment that we are publishing on chain it's identity state we are calling and is it like a merkle tree or is it a hash of something or what exactly is an identity state yeah identity state is actually a hash of three merkle trees the first one is claims Merkle tree. The other one is revocations tree. And third one is roots tree. And it's very obvious what is doing this roots tree. But we are adding this claims tree root into roots tree. And it allows us to prove different things without having to ask issuer to reveal newest state of Merkle tree. Okay. And uh, so claims are put in, into this tree and it's a binary structure and we have some fields in it. We have claim schema, we have identifier to whom it was issued. And this claims tree, is it like a map that maps something to a claim or is it just like a, is there like a public key that maps to a specific claim or how does it work? It's a sparse Merkle tree yep. and we are putting each claim in a specific place in this tree. So we have some fields of the claim that we hash together and it makes this pass in this tree. Okay. So. And is that the identifier or is that something else? It's claim schema, identifier, and some additional flags. Got it. And of course, we have data in this claim. And for revocations, it's the same, but we are putting here just revocation nonces. 
We we have yeah. them in here in in the claims. So each claim has revocation nonce, and when we want to revoke something, we need to add this revocation nonce to revocation tree. And the path in this tree would be the same as path in this tree, right? For a given claim. No, it, it will be revocation nonce will be used as a path. Okay, I see. And regarding roots tree, so we are putting the updated roots here, adding from time to time. Like each time we are publishing. So it's kind of like a historical, historical record of the yeah. claim trees. So it, it's a living tree. We are always adding new claims there. Same for evocation. We are updating it. And for the claims, we are adding this claims tree root. This Roots tree. Okay, this makes sense. Now, um, this gets recorded on a blockchain. And what is the like? Who, who does the updates? How does that work? If you could explain it. We have a smart contract on chain that verifies state transition. So it's a special circuit that we have that checks that it's actually identity who calls keys updating is updating this state on chain. And it could be more complicated in the future. Like we can uh, in the future check that, for example, claims were not removed from this tree or revocations were not deleted. And more complex, maybe, state transitions. I think it might be helpful to go through like maybe an example of how a user would use a system to let's say I want to get a claim, like I want some get a claim from some issuer and then I want to use it somewhere. How would this work? Yeah, so imagine we have this university. So university has, uh, is running an issuer and updating this identity states and claims. So diploma would be of schema diploma, for example. Then identifier would be user's uh, identity and the data that is actually grades and so on. And the issuer puts it in his Merkle tree, but also it signs it with, with a digital signature. It has keys and actually keys of public key of the issuer lives also in this tree somewhere as a claim. So we have actually two types of claims. It's kind of self claims and also claims that identity is doing towards another identity. And one question that actually I didn't think about before is, so this identity state is that, does each issuer create a separate identity state for their claims or do all the claims from different issuers are in the same identity state? Or how, if you were saying a university wants to do it, would the university create a different smart contract which stores a separate identity state only for this university or does it somehow get merged across different issuers? All the issuers are using the same smart contract. They are updating identity states there, but each issuer has its own chain of identity states. I have mentioned state transition function and for each identity state, here it is checked that this transition from previous state to new one is correct. And it is the same for different issuers as they are running in parallel. Okay, the identity states like are in the same smart contract, but let's say Cambridge would have one identity state and then Harvard and Stanford would have other identity states and so forth. And obviously for uh, other types of issuers, you would have also different identity states. Okay, yeah. makes sense. And I guess there is logic that enforces that if I'm Stanford, I cannot update Harvard's identity state. And yeah, like that. So it's checked inside this uh, transition function. Yep. Makes that sense. There's actually also zero knowledge circuit. So in, in future it could be more complicated. For cases like DAO, you would like to maybe have different doing on behalf of the uh, this identity doing some claims. I actually would like to come back to it later about like how zero knowledge fits into this, but let's finish the example first. Yeah, diploma as a claim would be added to this tree of claims. And then it will be sent to the device of user. Actually, user will fetch it from the issuer. So and the issuer would submit a transaction that updates a smart contract on, on chain that has this uh, 
new commitment to the claim, but the actual data the issuer would give to the user device or whatever, and that's how it gets stored. Okay? Yeah. And at the moment when we have this published on chain, user can now prove that he has this claim and he can generate proofs based on this. But what happens if, if issuer doesn't publish it quickly? Should I wait for 10 minutes or one hour until it's published on chain? So in these cases we have actually digital signature that we can use from the issuer to immediately use this kind of claims without waiting until it's published on chain. I see. And we, it's the same more or less level of security, but when it's published on chain, it has additional properties. Like we can prove that uh, this claim wasn't good just now. We can prove that it was added at some point. And also we can prove that it is a unique claim. For example, if we have a competition and we want only one identity to receive claims that he's a winner of com this competition. So with Merkle trees and Merkle tree proofs, we can prove that this is unique claim and prove such kind of things. Okay. And I'm guessing also, if you just rely on signature, you can prove revocation. So if you want to prove that the claim was revoked, you do need to do check against the Merkle tree. Is that right? Regarding revocations, it, it works the same with Merkle tree proofs and the signature proofs. So when issuer needs to revoke something, he adds revocation nonce to the tree and then needs to publish it on chain. And from that moment, it's not possible to use this claim anymore. And it doesn't matter if it was Merkle tree proof of inclusion into this tree or it was signature proof from the... I see. So even when you try to use a claim and using a signature, you still need to include a proof that it is not part of the revocation tree. Yes. Okay, got it. Another question. I'm assuming, you know, the state rules change all the time. So if I have this data, how do I know against, like when I generate a proof, how do I know against which state route to generate my proof so that do I need to keep all the data or kind of continuously monitor the updates So how does it work? Yeah, this part, the tree itself is private and it's not published anywhere, but the revocation tree, roots tree, it should be public. It should be accessible to everyone together with claims tree root. With that, identity could go and check that uh, its claim wasn't revoked by just fetching this revocation tree and fetching the correct to, to the revocation ones. And actually, it doesn't need to fetch the whole tree and even the whole path. Just because it's not changing too much, it would be maybe just a few levels that needs to be fetched and then hashes would match, and that's also a privacy feature. Okay, so the expectation is that the user needs to know about this they, before they can generate a proof of the some claim. They need to get this data from somewhere. And then for this is known only to the issuer, is that? Right, okay. and when issuer creates the claim and sends uh, to, to the user, he also sends Merkle tree proof of inclusion into this tree to, to the user and also signature proof. Okay. Okay. Like it's just a digital signature together with the claim. And later we can prove that it's included into this Merkle tree in two different ways. One is having reference to some older state of the issuer that is published on chain and with this Merkle tree proof of inclusion into the tree and together with these two, two other routes, we can hash them together and get identity state that is on, on chain, but it reveals a bit of information at least when this claim was issued and sometimes you don't want to say that when it was issued because maybe it was only one claim issued at the time. Maybe a small group and then it could be possible to reveal your identity. And for such things we are actually using this roots tree. So you always can reference to 
the claims tree root in this tree and always generate proofs that are going to the latest state of the uh, issuer. Makes sense. So now we understand how the system works more or less. And it seems to me that you don't necessarily need to have zero knowledge proofs everywhere. You can verify signatures, you can provide proofs via Merkle paths. But obviously you mentioned zero knowledge proofs several times and I'm curious which parts of the system are they used for and for what purpose? It is used for privacy. We want to hide some data. We can generate proofs of some statements that are not directly inside the claims. Like age, we could compute it from date of birth, for example. And also we can do authentication on some website or uh, inside application without revealing your identity, your claims, and uh, just proving that it is the same identity coming to this application. So basically, instead of a user giving a Merkle path to some verifier who wants to verify some claim, and then the verifier going and looking into these trees or being able to retrieve data from there, what we do is the user generates zero knowledge proofs and first, like they do the work, they look up the data, they make sure that it's not revoked and all of that stuff. And then they give that proof to the, to the verifier. Okay. And you also mentioned that zero knowledge proof is used here for some purpose. What is that for? It's to control that identity is doing state transition in a correct way. So it could be very complicated rules that wouldn't fit in just smart contract, some code. So it could check that you have claim, for example, that you are allowed to transition the state, or it could be some other logics here. So those proofs would be generated by the issuers, is that right? Yes. So when, whenever they update this, the identity state, they would need to generate the proof that they didn't try to cheat and remove somebody for with no reason or edit somebody twice or whatever. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. All right, now I'm really curious about the circuits that you guys are using. First, I mean, let's start with the ones that the user uses to generate their proofs. Yeah, so we can draw it in a simple way. So we have zero knowledge circuit and it has some inputs. Some of them are public inputs. And we need them to verify that commitments are correct, that it, it should refer data that is on-chain or parameters that we are proving, for example, age, something that we need to verify on side of the verifier. And private inputs. And for Private inputs, we are actually providing this, the claim itself and also Merkle tree proof or the proof that it was issued. And uh, we are providing proof that revocation wasn't, revocation nonce wasn't included into the issuer's revocation tree. And on the output, we have the proof, ZK proof. And with that, with public data and zero knowledge proof, verifier can check that the statement is correct and data is published on chain, the anchors, and be sure that a user is following the requirements that this verifier sets. So like to run through an example, maybe to use a university or checking age, like what would be, let's say, public and private inputs in, the, in a concrete example? So, for example, on computing age, we would provide the claim as one of the inputs that has day of birth data. And inside this circuit, we are doing computations and we can do a few different operations. We created generic circuits to do some basic mathematical stuff. And just, for example, we can check equation of some data field. We can check that it's less or greater than some value that we want, or it's in the list, for example. 
if you want to make sure that, for example, country of residence is in the list of allowed ones or not in the list, like blacklist of countries. And these operations are going as public inputs and also the value that we want to check against, for example, it could be 18 for age or it could be a list of value for these operations. Makes sense. So basically the operation would be a public input, let's say, if you wanted to verify that somebody is over 21, 21 would be a public input and then maybe type of claim would be a public input as well, yes. so that you know what you're checking against. And then the claim itself would be private input. And then like something about revocation should be a private yeah. input as so, well. So as a private input, we would provide non-revocation proof and also proof that claim was correctly issued. It, it could be a signature or it could be Merkle tree proof. Makes sense. Now, it's interesting that you provide the operation as one of the public inputs. Why not have a separate circuit for every different operation or maybe even build it dynamically? The problem is that we don't want to have too many circuits because for each circuit we need to do a trusted setup. Okay, and we're, you're using Growth 16 as a proving system? Yeah, we're using Growth 16 and it requires trusted setup and we want to minimize the need for it. And for that, we've built a few generic circuits that can do such kind of operations. And it covers a lot of cases. And Verifier doesn't need to have some specific circuit, write it himself or some other rely on third party circuits to, uh, to verify some data. Makes sense. So you basically encoded this in a single circuit and you also standardize the schema so that the circuit works. So like for a given type of claim, you have a given schema. So you know that if you apply this operation to a given schema, then it will the result should be correct. And also as public input, we are providing part of the issuer and some other data that we can reference, like this non-revocation proof and signature that is actually coming from this issuer. Okay, so basically what this says is that I have a claim I have a claim from this issuer that proves that my age is over 21 or something like that. That's the idea. Right. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. So this so we get the zero knowledge proof in the end and I think you mentioned earlier that there are two different ways to use it. Could you explain this a bit more? Yeah, so with this ZK proof we can prove something off-chain, obviously, like we can log in, for example, to a website and prove that we are allowed to do something on this website, like to vote for some uh, in, uh, cases like DAO or something, we can vote for proposals. And this is the off-chain use? Yeah, it's okay. off-chain use, but it could be implemented also on-chain if you want to do the same on-chain and it would be a smart contract that is receiving zero-knowledge proof and then you would be allowed to do some actions inside this smart contract like vote or withdraw funds or some other actions. And I guess this is probably one of the reasons why you need to go with Growth 16 because if you want to post proofs on chain they should be fairly small. You can go with some other system that maybe a bit more flexible here, but then the proofs would be much bigger. Yes. So it was one of the restrictions we wanted to proofs to be usable on chain. But the other thing is that we want proofs to be generated on mobile phones. And Gross 16 allows us to do this pretty quickly. And How much time does it take to generate like an average claim proof, I guess? Yeah, we are working on optimization, but right now it's about five seconds to generate the proof. And we are working and I think it will be about one second to generate the proof. Okay, that's really good. And I guess that leads me to another question. Besides optimizations, what other things are you guys working on or trying to build into Polygon ID in the future? Yeah, one of the things is also extending this query language to support more operations, do more complex stuff and 
optimization, as I mentioned. And also we are building a platform so that issuers would be able to just call it regular APIs to issue claims, to do all the stuff without needing to manage the keys themselves and so on. It's, it's just for ease of use. And of course, the issuers could run our node and do it themselves. Also, we are building a testation platform. Polygon Verify is such source of trust in the beginning. We are doing, we can do KYC, we can do some other stuff. And this is very useful for different applications to provide civil resistance, to provide for regulated applications, proof that this person was checked against AML, KYC regulations. And we are working on this different... Interesting. So in this case, would Polygon be considered an issuer or how does it work? So Polygon Verify is an issuer. Okay. But we are aiming to bring much more different issuers, KYC providers, social media. User himself should be able to issue claims about others and about himself. Interesting. Okay, very exciting. I think this was a great session. Thank you so much, Alexander. Thank you.